put back one here. Awesome. Okay, Fabian, this is Paul. We, since you're here now, nice to see you. And we are uh, streaming to the webcast cloud now and recording to the cloud. Okay, great, great, great. I believe no it's 12.01. How are we doing on participants? Are we ready to start or do we want to give them a few more minutes? I think we're ready to start. Okay. Great, great, great. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Environmental Justice Community Partnership Meeting. Um, second day of September. Hope everyone is well and, and healthy and safe. Uh, let's call this meeting to order. Again, uh, just would like to say hope everyone is well and safe and uh, following all of the orders, staying, staying at home, wearing your mask as appropriate. Um, we had a great meeting last time we met. Uh, appreciate everyone's comments. Um, you know, things continue to happen in, in, in our world that uh, are quite unknown to a lot of us, quite unfamiliar to a lot of us, but... Um, I really think that we're gonna be okay. I, I really, really think we're gonna be okay. Uh, we've got an action-packed agenda today, so I'm not gonna take a lot of your time. Um, I'll, I'll go on and go through the agenda. Let's have an approval of the June 3rd, 2020 meeting, um, minutes Fabian, from that meeting. Fabian, this is Teresa. Um, could you do the housekeeping? Could we go through the housekeeping stuff first? Oh, you are absolutely right, Teresa. Uh, Julie, you're going to read the uh, housekeeping notes for us? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. So um, well, we will do our best to facilitate a smooth meeting with public participation. We ask that everyone be patient as we navigate this together. We have two formats for participation, the Zoom web application as well as teleconference. Before we begin, I want to review some guidelines and general instructions for the meeting. These are very important, so I ask that you pay close attention. Please silence your other communication devices, such as your cell phone or your desk phone. This will ensure that we are not hearing any feedback or causing interruption during the meeting. During the meeting, all participants on Zoom, except for board members and South Coast AQMD staff, will be placed on mute by the host. That means that you will not be able to mute or unmute your lines manually. After each agenda item, a Ms. Wesson will announce for public comment. For video Zoom instructions, for those of you that are using Zoom, if you would like to make a public comment on the Zoom screen, please click on the raise hand button. This will signal to the host that you would like to provide public comment and you'll be added to the list. If you're using Zoom on your smartphone, please tap the raise hand button on the screen. And for those of you that are using landline, you can dial star nine on your keypad to signal that you would like to comment. Your name will be called when it is your turn to comment and the host will unmute your line automatically. Please note, you can hang up or leave the Zoom meeting at any time. With regard to decorum, please be ad adhere to the speaker time limit, which is three minutes here. Please treat others with courtesy and civility and respect the public meeting process. Rules prohibiting the use of signs or posters remain in effect for video participation. Profanity, discriminatory comments or obscene gestures is prohibited. Disorderly, unruly or aggressive behavior that infringes upon the rights of others or disrupts the group Good working order of the meeting is also prohibited. Any violation of the above rules can result in your mic being muted, your video feed shut off, or you will be dropped from the phone or Zoom meeting lines. Thank you so much. And next, uh, Fabian will provide opening remarks. 
<laughs> okay, I do want to uh, thank you, Julie, for that. We really appreciate that um, that information, and and I I do want to introduce and welcome two new members. We have two members to our group, and and we are just so happy to number one enlarge our numbers and increase our outreach out into our communities but to welcome these two individuals who will be a great asset to our committee. Uh, the first one, and, and please forgive me, Pamela, if I, if I don't say this right, but it looks like it's Pamela at City. Is that correct, Pamela? Is Pamela on mute? Can we take Pamela off of mute? That is correct. At City, it's correct. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Pamela, would you like to say a few things about yourself? We certainly are happy to have you. Absolutely. Um, I've been working with Moronga for a little over nine years now. I manage the air, tribal air program. Uh, we monitor uh, for a couple pollutants out there. We've got tons of uh, cool projects working with kids. Um, we've got the, um, some cool uh, education outreach stuff. We have a lot of cool indoor air quality issues that we're working with and making sure the community is aware of current indoor and outdoor air conditions. Conditions. Um, we just applied for a treatment estate. I'm not sure if you guys know what that is, but we also just had recently had a technical system audit on our air monitoring program. So we're very well, um, we've been monitoring at Morongo for over 15 years. And um, myself personally, I'm a graduate from Cal State Northridge in LA even though I work on Riverside, um, LA is um, in LA County and South Coast is primarily my home. Wonderful. Well, again, welcome. Um, I have a personal affinity for Morongo because they host one of the best golf tournaments around. Uh, missed it this year because of COVID-19, but it also benefits, the, 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 the tournament benefits the children uh, in the area. And it's just, it's a great, great tournament. So we appreciate you um, uh, being part of our, our new family. Thank you. We also have with us Lachey. Am I saying that right? Lachey Rodriguez. Welcome, Lachey. We'd love to have you speak for a few moments. Great. Yes, it's a pleasure to um, actually be here. Um, I am actually Chief of Staff to Orange County Supervisor Doug Chafee. And um, environmental justice has always been just passionate about, uh, very passionate about me. And um, I've just noticed in certain areas in our community, we do have a lot of warehousing coming up and they are um, coming up next to some homes and areas. And I've noticed there's a lot of uh, locations within our district that have kind of a nexus where certain cities meet. So therefore there's different zoning per city and they're not really taking account to what the other cities are zoning next to them. So I'm finding that there's um, a lot of issues with some of our lower income communities and disadvantaged communities being subjected to um, unjust air quality as well as having um, protections around some of the trucks and traffic going into their area and so I'm um, just so excited to serve on this board and hopefully uh, work with um, South Coast to really uh, bring this issue to light but hopefully come up to the resolution and working with the uh, three cities that um, are covered in that area to help find some solutions for the community so it's a pleasure to be here to get to know everybody and to move forward and I see a familiar face of Italia over there back in my days when I actually used to work in Riverside, San Bernardino County. Um, I used to work for Assembly Member Jose Medina and State Senator Connie Leva. And we worked with a lot of environmental justices out there, especially dealing with our warehousing situation and congestion on our freeways between the, uh, the 60 freeway and the 91. So um, it's very close to my heart. And so I'm very excited to serve on this board with everybody. Well, you'll see, and we're excited to have you, certainly, Lachey. You'll see, you mentioned the word nexus. You'll see a nexus of a community of friends that we all have a passion for environmental justice. From So you'll see that from time to time that you'll see old friends. So I'm glad you and Natalia, <laughs> Natalia will be presenting later on. So we look forward to that. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. And again, welcome to you both. We, we know that you bring a wide array of skill sets and talents and, and passion to this committee. And we look forward to uh, further exploring that. So welcome. Welcome again. Um, I, I think I had made my remarks. Um, and I now uh, we're at the approval of the June 3rd uh, minutes from the meeting of June 3rd. May I have a motion for that, please? Don't everybody speak at one time. <laughs> Patty Marquez, so move. Thank you, Ed. May I have a second for that motion, please? 
This is Teresa Martinez, all second. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, it's been moved and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, the motion passes. The, oh, I guess I should do it all in favor by, what are we doing? Show of verbal hand, uh, uh, hands or roll call? Do a roll call, Julie. Okay. Pamela at City. I'm here. Okay, we're taking um, a motion on the minutes. So you may. I know. I, I, well, I wasn't here. Am I allowed to do this? I wasn't here in the last meeting. So abstain. We'll put abstain. you as Yes. Sorry. Ara Brasendo. No, Ara. Italia Garcia. Aye. Valerie Gonzalez. Aye. Lisa Hart. Uh, I have to abstain because I forgot to read them. I apologize. Okay. In honesty, I love that. Todd Heibel. Aye. Thank you. Sahara. Eddie Marquez. Aye. Teresa Martinez. Aye. Lachey Rodriguez. That's abstain. I was not here at the last meeting. Thank you. Oscar Rodriguez. Aye. Sienna Thomas. Paula Andrea Toraldo Plaza. Aye. Rebecca Zaragoza. Abstain. The motion passes. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll now do a, a follow up, of, a review of the follow up action items from the last meeting. Uh, the number one action item was South Coast AQM staff, AQMD staff will modify the advisory council goal number seven to increase awareness of rel uh, relative EJ legislation and legislative issues. An email with the updated goals and objectives was sent to the advisory council me uh, members on August the 21st of 2020. Number two item was South Coast AQM staff will provide the advisory council members with Ron Moskowitz, who is the head of IM, contact, contact information for any follow-up questions and recommendations for future updates to the South Coast mobile application. Advisory Council members were emailed Ron's contact information on August the 21st, 2020. South Coast AQM staff will provide Latino faith leaders from Embrace LA to Miss Martinez. This is partly my fault. The contact information was provided, I believe, either yesterday or earlier today to uh, Miss Martinez. Teresa, I apologize. Uh, and this is really no my fault. Worries. But the contact information is my son. I mean, really, how, how, I, <laughs> why couldn't I have told you that that day? Because I didn't remember, number one, that he would have been uh -huh. the contact person. I did remember that it was him and my husband that came up with this whole idea. So yeah. uh, it just, it just kind of buried itself. But he's waiting for your call. I've spoken to him. Okay. Uh, knows that you know you want you know whatever leaders that we have had involved and then I just needed to expand this because you know also Black Lives Matter they work with brown uh brown lives so you know they welcome anyone they yes. will anyone so know that that's a resource also and I'll continue to uh open up on this uh uh, uh and and get back with you I won't I won't let this slip again my apologies because I do know other folks that are involved okay, okay. 
No worries. Okay, thank you. Sure. And then number four, South Coast AQMD staff will reschedule agenda item number seven, which is the EJCP efforts to the September 2nd, 2020 meeting agenda, which the item is on today's agenda. So we are uh, in step and online um, with, uh, I think, what we need to be. And uh, are there any questions on that? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to uh, agenda item number four, which is the 2020 state legislative update. That's gonna be given by uh, LPAM member, Philip Crabb, who is a public affairs manager and uh, quite good at what he does, if I say so myself. So welcome, Philip, glad to have you. Thank you. I uh, very much appreciate that uh, introduction. Um, we can move on to the next slide. There we go. Um, and yeah, as Damien said, happy to be here. Um, I'm the lead on state legislation. Um, I've been working for the district for almost 13 years now. So happy to uh, be able to provide kind of like a just state legislative roundup. Um, for this year and with a little bit of emphasis on some environmental justice legislation. So how about the next slide, please? So just to overview, we'll go over some of the bills that uh, South Coast has taken a position on. Um, and then also in terms of bills that are the state budget and then also some environmental justice focused legislation. Next slide, please. And hit it one more time, please. There we go. Okay, so just to kind of give some context, the state legislature, we basically go in, they go in two year legislative sessions. So um, this was the second year of the legislative se session. Um, basically what will happen is if you introduced something in 2019, for example, and it didn't pass the legislature, you can kind of put it on hold and you get a little bit of leeway to try to get it passed in 2020. Um, so this was the legislature reconvened early January. Um, as usual, there was, you know, before COVID, so there was over 2,000 bills that were introduced this year. However, once that occurred uh, with the pandemic happening in March, uh, there was a big push, obviously, to reduce the number of bills that were um, being considered. Um, there was not enough time. Obviously, there was a shortened schedule, and I'll go into that in the next slide a little bit. Um, basically, what we came to most recently um, near the end of session was only about 25% of the bills that were introduced were still active. And that's a significant drop from what normally happens um, during the legislative session. Mm -hmm. um, so it actually just ended on Monday. Uh, the session adjourned on August 31st, and the governor will now have about a month to basically take action on all those bills. Now, either he can veto the bill um, or he can sign it into law. And just so you know, if he takes no action at all, then that'll actually also allow for the bill to become law. Um, next slide, please. So just to kind of address uh, the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on the state legislative session this year, which was huge, um, essentially what happened was um, back in you know, mid-March, the, the Senate and the Assembly adjourned um, and they did not able to come back for nearly two months. And that's a huge uh, chunk out of the legislative calendar. Um, that's part of the reason why so few bills were able to be considered in the end. Um, also, um, even during their summer recess, they took a summer recess near, around July um, and they had to, because of a certain number of the legislators and staff um, being uh, diagnosed with COVID-19, they had to extend uh, their summer vacation by two more weeks to allow for um, safety protocols and things like that. And even most recently, even last week, um, right near the end of session, um, there was another senator that was diagnosed with COVID-19 and they basically had to be, um, they took, the Senate had to shut down for a whole day um, to kind of accommodate that. Um, so next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so basically I'll talk about some of the bills. So South Coast AKMD will take positions on bills that could be an oppose, a support. Sometimes we'll say support if amended. So you have to change the bill for us to be supportive of it. Um, that's the way that we kind of try to um, assert our kind of um, influence and, and our policy priorities up in Sacramento. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, there was several, actually we focused on four different backup generator builds that came up this year. Three were focused on diesel backup generators and one was focused on natural gas backup generators. So um, the first one, AB2182 by Assemblywoman Rubio, um, basically was looking to get an exemption for a local, regional, and state regulation on the usage and testing and maintenance of backup generators. So, um, you know, these are obviously, you know, hospitals will use them, you know, uh, water agencies actually use them. It's, it's, it's pretty common, especially with all the blackouts that we're having with the wildfires. So it's definitely an issue. Um, now, the thing is, backup generators, and I'll get into a little bit more in a second, but they have, they're very large, they're very dirty, and they're a huge source of pollution, especially diesel particulate matter. Um, so obviously looking for, um, a, this bill was looking for a full blanket exemption on how long they could run their backup generators. Um, and so we opposed that bill. Um, and also let me run through the other one too, SB 1099 Dodd. Um, this one also was dealing with the same kind of, uh, of critical facilities, which is again, water districts, police, fire, emergency communication centers, things like that. Um, this one was a little bit less um, expansive, but it was still focused on requiring local air districts to change their rules, basically to provide an exemption so that if these particular critical type of facilities were using backup generators, they basically got a free pass and they were able to operate their generators as much as they wanted, um, not ex basically uh, being exempt fully from our 200 hour uh, limit that we have. Um, so we also uh, oppose this bill. But let me go a little bit into the, the generator issue just to, to give some context. You know, first of all, you know, Air, the South Coast understands the importance of backup generators providing that backup power during emergencies. Um, and like I said before, um, basically facilities are allowed to run their backup generators or what we call bugs um, for 200 hours. And then um, that includes 20 to 100 hours of maintenance and testing, depending on the age and emission levels of those bugs. And this is uh, that particular part of maintenance and testing is controlled by CARB's air toxics control measure. So, um, but also exemptions to bug usage limits can be granted through our local air district variance process. And that's if, you know, there's a critical need for power, um, then we're, you know, willing to take consideration. It's our hearing board that will make that decision whether or not they can allow them to go beyond that limit. Um, but it's important to ensure that the backup power is provided in a way that minimizes potential harmful public health impacts of diesel emissions um, on the community that can be caused by bugs. In the South Coast, we have uh, more than 10,000 permitted backup generators in the four county jurisdiction of varying sizes and ages and emission levels. And about 40% of these generators are about 20 years, more than 20 years old. The oldest generator was installed in 1975. Um, and these bugs are basically oftentimes very large as well. So the potential for increased diesel emissions as a result of these two bills and the other bills that I'll talk about on the next slide was significant. Um, over 2000 diesel backup generators within the South Coast were affected by each of these bills separately. Um, they were overlapping, they were the same 2000 or so um, bugs. But um, that had the potential to emit a significant amount of NOx and diesel particulate matter. And many of these um, bugs were near residences and schools. And just one final example is just, there was you know, public safety power shutoffs or PSPS events. There was one in 2019 in LA and San Bernardino counties. And we calculated that nearly six tons of NOx emissions per day were admitted, were emitted by those bugs affected by these bills. Um, that were within the PSP affected area. So it was just a specific part of the South Coast District. Um, and this would be, this calculation would be based assuming that all the bugs that were in the area were being operated during this power outage. Um, so that level of, mission, of emissions by all those backup generators is higher than the average daily emissions of the largest oil refinery in the South Coast. So that's basically just to give you a context of the ability of these um, to, to cause increased emissions and within the community. So you can see why we were not really happy with bills that were trying to um, either exempt, get exemptions or chain, limit our authority in terms of how we could regulate um, these types of backup generators. We opposed both of these particular bills and luckily they both died. The first one didn't get a hearing. The second one, SB 1099 Dodd, we were actually 
um, lobbying pretty actively and, and working with the stakeholders involved and the senators involved for, for a couple of months, actually. Um, next slide, please. So SB 802 Glazer was a similar type of bill. It just focused on hospitals and their backup generators. And is, again, was seeking, seeking an exemption from the time limits for usage, maintenance, and testing. Um, so that was actually a, ended up being merged into SB 1099 and we kind of addressed it all together, but we did oppose that bill and it was basically, it did die without getting a, a hearing. And the last one was SB 1185 by Senator Morlock. And this was the one that was focused on natural gas backup generators. Um, and again, natural gas generators are actually much cleaner. So we thought it was kind of odd that they were basically trying to force us to make rules that would give exemptions to these types of backup generators. But so we oppose this bill as well, and eventually it did die as well. So next slide, please. So moving on from the backup generator issue, um, there was a couple other bill, a few other bills that we took positions on this year. AB 2882 by Assemblymember Chu was focusing on school sites, and in particular charter schools and private schools. Um, basically, it wanted to make sure that those types of schools get the same requirements as public schools when it comes to citing where new schools should be located. Um, so it would take it increased the requirements in terms of looking at potential hazardous substances, emissions and wastes on, on sites for private schools and charter schools, and also added the sequel requirements to potential charter school sites. So um, South Coast AKMD uh, took a support position on this bill, and we also uh, thought that there might be a loophole in the bill that would not, um, so the bill wouldn't, might not apply to um, charter schools and private schools that were located on leased property. So we suggested an amendment uh, to the author um, to add and add in something language to close that loophole. Um, unfortunately, before we could get that amendment or it could move too far forward, uh, the bill did end up dying as well. Um, then also there was SB 662 by Senator Archuleta. This was focused on basically um, clean or basically zero emission type um, transportation uh, fueling basically. So this bill would, so was going to redefine transportation electrification as a term in state law to include renewable hydrogen as a transportation fuel that you can use in fuel cell EVs. Um, so basically, it also set a progressive standard for decarbonization of hydrogen transportation fuel. So basically trying to make that whole life cycle uh, be zero emission from the beginning to the end. And that was on the same schedule as, as was set for electricity um, by SB 100 by Senator De Leon uh, a few years back. Um, it also would allow for investments by gas um, investor owned utilities that would basically help to facilitate and accelerate um, hydrogen transportation infrastructure to kind of help with the electrification or, you know, the new term of electrification and zero emission type of transportation technology available in California. Um, we did support that bill, but unfortunately that one died as well. And as you can tell what I mentioned earlier, a lot of bills died this year. So um, this one I was told will be reintroduced next year. So we'll see, um, hopefully can have more success. But uh, next slide, please. And the last position bill, um, SB 895 by Senator Archuleta again. This was again focusing on zero emission uh, fueling infrastructure and transportation technologies. Basically, this was kind of a little specialty bill. The California Energy Commission or CEC um, had a fund with about $4.6 million in it. And it was originally focused on um, helping to advance technology for clean diesel projects. Now, clean diesel is not so clean anymore compared to the many other types of technologies that are available. And so CEC as a policy decision basically was not funding clean diesel projects. So that money was kind of stuck in the account. So this bill was basically trying to be creative and say, hey, let's expand to just zero emission uh, type other projects that this money can be allowed to be allocated for. So they went along the process and this bill actually, we uh, took a support position on it and it actually did pass the legislature. So it is on, sitting on the governor's desk waiting for his action. But one big caveat is that during the budget process, there was a lot of borrowing of money from different accounts. So um, the state did end up borrowing $4 million of the $4.6 million um, basically to help balance the budget. So that left only $600,000 left for this bill's purposes. 
Um, so in the end, if the governor does sign it, at least 600,000 will be able to go towards zero emission projects, but obviously it's a big drop from what was originally sought. Next slide, please. So speaking of the budget, uh, let me give you a hit one more time, please. Thank you. So um, there was a over $54 billion budget shortfall caused by the COVID-19 recession. And that was the big story, obviously, on what we're trying to, you know, trying to address this year. Not only did it hurt the schedule and reduce the amount of time that legislators were able to act, but there was a, a huge drop in available funding. Um, we managed to work with other air districts and stakeholders to secure $50 million statewide for air district implementation of, AB, of the AB 617 program. So that was a big win. Um, you know, obviously we need more funding, but in this COVID year, it was, it was, uh, we would take the 50 million because uh, as you'll see, um, there was a lot of other funding that was not allocated this year. So indeed, this slide says likely no budget trailer bill, but now that the session has ended, we know that there was no trailer bill, uh, budget trailer bill allocating greenhouse gas reduction fund monies, and those come from the cap and trade program and the auction revenues. Um, one big reason why that happened was at the May 2020 auction only generated $25 million. Now, normally these auctions generate 600 to 700 million dollars and there's four per year so you can see the large amount of money generated so there was really no idea what might happen at the august auction that just happened recently um, the good news is the august auction did jump up significantly and generated um, about 474 million dollars so there was hope that maybe the next two um, auctions might be much better and there may not be as much as there was the past few years but there might be some funding there that if it's not borrowed or taken for other purposes that hopefully we can get some of that money back um, for AB 617 incentives. Um, last year, we got 245 million statewide and South Coast got about 86 million. And then it goes towards, you know, um, like top car moyer type programs or basically turning dirty vehicles and equipment into turning the fleet over into cleaner equipment, providing incentives to help do that and reducing emissions significantly with that. Um, so unfortunately we got zero uh, dollars at this point this year. We're hoping that there may be a special session later in 2020 or um, if there's something that we'll have to address in 2021 to kind of get money from this past year. So things like the clean vehicle rebate, pro or rebate project, CBRP, also EFMP, um, there was significant amounts of money allocated last year and it's zero money for this year. And also technical assistance to community groups for this type of funding um, also was 10 million last year, but zero this year. So we'll see, hopefully we'll be able to, you know, undo some of this um, lack of allocation of funding um, but we'll see, we have to move forward and be aggressive on that. Next slide, please. There was also a proposed joint economic stimulus plan that was proposed, um, you know, basically it was focused on spurring job creation, try to provide extra uh, protections for Californians, a little bit of reliance on federal money. I mean, the $100 billion number was pretty huge. There was creative ways of trying to raise the money through the, a new tax voucher system. When they talk about securitizing current revenue streams, you know, it's basically like the greenhouse gas reduction fund has like auctions and it generates money every year. Um, but this would basically say like, okay, we can bond it or say like, okay, we assume we're going to get a billion dollars a year. Can I get basically an advanced loan on that money? And then we'll pay you off with the revenue stream. That's kind of what that is talking about. So it's trying to find a creative ways. Now, the biggest thing that might have helped us from this plan was a dedicated fund for, again, incentives to turn over vehicles to cleaner fleets and generate more EV charging infrastructure. But unfortunately, you know, it was a grand plan, uh, but negotiations between the governor and legislature broke down, uh, uh, lack of agreement on priorities and lack of, you know, the ability to really generate the funding in a, in a, in a way that people could support, um, I think were key obstacles. And so um, there was in the end, no real uh, economic stimulus plan from the state. Next slide, please. So just to, to finish off with a couple of other environmental justice related type legislation, um, AB 345 by Assemblymember Mayor Tsuchi. Uh, this was focused on the California Natural Resources uh, Agency, just trying to create more um, EJ programs and more grant-based programs, basically, and to include more community involvement in their rulemaking and regulatory processes. Another key is that basically it was going to require uh, regulations to establish a minimum setback 
feedback distance between gas production and related operations um, away from the community. Um, and it would be based on, you know, basically health and scientific data. Um, this was, you probably might have seen some headlines on this particular bill, but in the end, it did die. Um, I know I've heard some of the um, agency uh, directives have been, you know, supposed looking at this issue. So hopefully the matter is not dead. Um, and hopefully there can be some movement on the policy level from the administration. But if not, I'm sure there'll be another bill next year. And uh, the next slide, please. And then we have AB 995 by Assemblywoman Christina Garcia. Um, I'll just, I'll break the suspense. This bill actually did pass, <laughs> one of the few, um, and is on the governor's desk to be considered. But this one was, again, focused on dealing with the Department of Toxic Substance Control, or DTSC, which you probably are aware has had a lot of criticism over the years on what it's doing in terms of cleaning up toxics uh, within the communities. Also, it's had serious funding issues and things like that. So this bill is creating a board of environmental safety and basically provide putting the Cal, California Environmental Protection Agency or Cal EPA um, in an oversight position and also to give it policy direction to the DTSC. Um, this bill is pretty extensive and does a lots of different things that go to the slide, um, but it does basically increase the public process um, it's reviewing DTSC's duties and responsibilities, their hazardous facility permits, mitigation programs, and basically trying to look at all that proposed statutory, regulatory, and policy changes. Also, you know, hearing, deciding appeals for hazardous waste permit decisions, and just providing more opportunities for the public to get involved in, you know, per permitted and remediation sites, and basically how they were um, getting more responsive in terms of public concerns with what DTSC is doing. Um, so there's, it's a lot more expensive. Another key thing it does is um, kind of reconfiguring the fees in terms of trying to generate more funding um, for this particular agency and for the toxic remediation efforts and all the things that it does to try to address that issue, those issues within California. Um, so that, like I said, that bill is waiting for the governor's action. Um, maybe the next slide, please. And that's the end of the presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you all might have and I'll, I'll stay around as well later throughout the call. Thank you so much, uh, Philip. That was quite comprehensive and as usual, delivered in your well professional manner. No, you just know your subject matter so well and, and that's just so helpful to the agency. Uh, are there any questions of Philip? See, I don't see any participant hands. See what I mean? You did such a, a good job. I mean, any questions? Great, great. Thank you, Philip. We appreciate you. Uh, next on our agenda, but before we go there, I'd like to just take a moment and, and thank Lisa Hart for her thoughtful and insightful discussion uh, led last uh, meeting on the impacts of COVID-19 in, in our communities. I think what it did show is that services still continue. We still continue to operate uh -huh. as agencies. Uh, complaints are still being answered. I know we're conducting virtual inspections. So I, I do want to thank Lisa for that. Um, it was it was great. And offer that opportunity to any other CS, I'm CSC, I'm going to AB 617, sorry guys, any EJCP um, members to lead discussions on subject matter that's relative to environmental justice and cleaning the air that we breathe. So moving on, I would like, are any questions or comments? Maybe, and you do have two uh, with raised hands. Oh, I see, Teresa. All right, Teresa Martinez. Can we, is she unmuted? Teresa, go ahead. Teresa, she just muted herself. <laughs> Teresa, you're muted. There you go. Hi, Teresa, we can't hear you. Okay, why Teresa's getting her audio together, we'll go to caller 
uh, ending in 990. Harvey, is that you? Hello? Maybe they really didn't have a question? Yes. Um, Here we go. Hello. Hi. It, it, it's Harvey, baby. Can you mm -hmm. hear me now? Hey, Harvey. Mm -hmm. I can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Um, in a couple of things. I'm disappointed not to see anything, any legislation here about homelessness and health and, uh, and the air pollution issues related to that. I've been in touch with a leader staff by name uh, Jeff, I think seven, seven, several months ago, and tried to get this a package for uh, home ownership vouchers. Uh, there's been a program around 20 years on the books with HUD, and, it, and it's not being pursued in the city and county. Excuse me, I'm outside, so uh, a bus just came by. If I could not have my time count, uh, and uh, you probably can't hear me. And I do want to address uh, the issue brought up on six. Six uh, sixty-three about hydrogen. Excuse me. Uh, um, Princeton University. Can you hear me now? Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, we can okay. hear you. Uh, on, on today's de democracy now, uh, and it's been around for a while. Princeton University has an eviction center, and they say forty million people by the end of the year can be homeless. Okay. And this affects the banks and whatnot. Uh, a third of the banks went out in the depression. We're, we're looking at those kind of numbers, okay? So um, between health and having a home and, and food, this, this, this is a no-brainer. This is the real world. And it, it, it should have a coordinated uh, effort by the air agencies and by the state different related agencies as well. And uh, anyway... So it includes that when you sell tax delinquent property, the right of first refusal goes to homeless people and low income people that want to live there. When you have property that that are developed and use tax credits, federal state tax credits that are you know 70, 80, 90 percent pays for the development, that could go to us as well. And if we can use it, great. If not, we do what others do. There's a market for it. And this is has to go to other types of financing and whatnot, and it should be done now. This is an emergency. It's a crisis. Okay. In reference to the hydrogen fuel, I know Ron has been pushing this, and we've done a dance for the last 20, 30 years on it. There, the existing bill for hydrogen said that it required, going back 15 years, that you had to have at least, I don't know if it was 25% or a third, had to be from solar hydrogen. This stuff's coming from natural gas. This is garbage. There's a big problem, the Arctic smelting, the Antarctic smelting. We've got natural gas and, uh, and uh, nitrous oxide coming up out of the wazoo, and we've totally ignored it. It's not gone before the border, and it's not part of IPCC. Okay. Every, we cannot use natural gas to make hydrogen, only solar, electrolysis, uh, et cetera. And that, that has to be looked at. And also, all of these issues have to be dealt with with equity and environmental justice now in the legislation, not later on. And, and, and it has to go to the very reevaluation. We brought this up on, on Friday that these are. Cap Sorry, uh, Harvey. Um, uh, anyway, thank you for your comment, Harvey. Teresa, were you available now to us? Uh, yes. Okay. I had to go to my phone for some reason, my computer was acting up, but well, I had a question for Philip. I just wanted to go back to the bugs issue. And because it seems like it's an issue that's gonna probably come before us in the future. Is there anything that South Coast AQMD is doing to address this? Because the, the um, bugs are actually, he said, I think he said over 20 years old, the generators. Uh, yeah, 40% of the, the ones in the South Coast are over 20 years old. Oh, 40 percent are over 20 years old. So are are you doing anything or are we <laughs> as your support group doing anything to address that situation? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say, first of all, just in terms of, you know, our current rules, you know, we we have our rulemaking or in, in terms of 200 hours to kind of limit their use. Um, and that's why there's a special limitation on those particular types of, of engines. Um, and then there is a variance process if that needs to go over, but we only had about three 
applications for um, variance applications over the last 12 months. So it's very rare that that happens. I see. Uh, okay. We definitely are supportive of, you know, moving forward with any efforts to try to slowly phase in cleaner equipment um, and move towards mm -hmm. cleaner technology. So I think options going forward, we're, I think it's still something that it's on, um, we're aware of it, it's a focus of ours. And, and the question is gonna be, what are the creative ways to do it? Funding is always an issue because they're, they're extremely large engines. So they're extremely mm -hmm. expensive engines. Um, so, um, you know, ways to try to facilitate that changeover, I think is something that will be contemplated by us going forward and we're definitely aware of the issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Philip. Were there any more questions or comments? I think that clears the board. All right, thank you all. Uh, our next presenter is Itaya Garcia. Itaya is an advisory council member, but she's also a member of CCAEJ. Uh, I always want to say G. It just seems, I guess, because the EJAG, <laughs> we have an EJAG community. But anyway, um, uh, we, we want to welcome Italia, but I also want to remind everyone that this presentation that she's going to give is a summary of CCAEJ activities and represents the views of CCAEG and not the district. Uh, we welcome you. We look forward to your presentation, Italia, and you can go on. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you all so much for allowing me this time to share a little bit about our organization, the work we've been doing, particularly uh, and during this COVID uh, time and times of transition and of learning and of growing as well. Um, as mentioned, my name is Italia Garcia. I serve as a political and programs director at CCAJ, the Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice. Uh, next slide. And um, I, I wanna start by saying that, uh, as mentioned as well, uh, all of these sort of uh, program highlights, recommendations, and um, sort of uh, cap, you know, capture um, CCAJ's work throughout the years, um, and also capture some innovative work that we really had to uh, implement due to the pandemic, as, as many of you I'm sure have, have been having to transition as well. And so this all reflects um, CCAJ and, and of course it's uh, based on our work as an organization. Next slide. And just a little bit about our organization for those who, uh, of you who are not familiar with um, CCAJ, the Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice. Uh, we're an environmental justice located, um, our physical office is in Harupa Valley off the 60 freeway. Uh, uh, right after the, the 15 and before the 91 freeway, but we work both in Riverside and San Bernardino counties, uh, primarily when it comes to Riverside County on the western side of Riverside County, and then in cities like San Bernardino City, uh, Fontana, Colton, uh, and other surrounding areas that have, have a high environmental justice populations. Next slide. And uh, a little bit of background about our organization. Uh, many of you who have been in the environmental justice uh, or just in general environmental advocacy uh, world uh, for, for years might know of our founder uh, and former executive director, Penny Newman. And so uh, Penny, you know, uh, has been a, a really a catalyst, uh, not just in the Inland Empire, but throughout the state and the nation in making sure that we uh, brought forth you know, uh, different issues that are, were affecting, or oh, are affecting the community. And back in the 70s, uh, that was the, one of the main thing was string fellow acid pits, uh, which led to the foundation of the organization. And so it was through that advocacy work on that specific project where uh, it eventually, you know, the, that case made it to the Supreme Court case and we got um, a super fun site out of it. So now we have the string fellow Acid Pit Superfund, uh, which you are more than welcome to. Uh, I don't know if they give tour. They're definitely not giving tours right now, but uh, they do from time to time open it up. And we also would give tours, um, not all the way. We cannot take you all the way to the to the acid uh, pit area where um, they are. You know, uh, they're you know still. It's going to take about, if I'm not mistaken, about 200 years to clean that site up. 
And so it's an ongoing thing, right? Um, and you're more than welcome to to read a little bit more about it. Um, and I actually would encourage you to. And so that's a little bit about how CCAJ got started. And uh, since then, you know, we've been addressing environmental justice issues. Uh, and they've been those issues have been changing. Why? Because the demographics in the region have been changing. Also, the issue areas and uh, our experiences to pollution uh, and to different uh, environmental justice impacts have been changing as well. Next slide. And uh, a little bit more about the organization uh, in terms of the work that we do, right? So uh, we try and, and we really have um, sort of a ground in being grassroots. And so a lot of our work comes from that mindset, right? That the community leads the work, that they put forth ideas, suggestions, projects. Um, you know, they bring to us a lot of the times the issues that, they, you know, they're facing that sometimes we're not aware of. And from there, we start, you know, organizing, right? We do policy advocacy and we do civic engagement. So those are kind of like our, our three pillars where we really try to empower community members to take it upon themselves to uh, get the resources, get equipped, and, you know, to make sure that they have, um, their voices are being heard at different stages of, of engagement, right? And so that, that's one of the things that we have over the years really pride ourselves in, in developing community leaders uh, who are, who we believe are uh, the experts in the room, you know, because they're the ones that are experiencing and living the environmental just injustices in, in the region. And next slide. And some of our uh, policy, uh, policy advocacy work that we have done um, has ranged, right? We have actually one of our, our strongest programs is the policy program, just because environmental justice, as you all know, can get very wonky, right? Can get very technical. And so for us, it's very important that we have not only staff, but that the members understand exactly what is it that we are either advocating for or that we are trying to educate ourselves more about. It could be a local policy, it could be a statewide, a federal, or even an, uh, an agency proposal, right, that uh, is going to impact our lives. And so part of that work that we do is a lot of education. And so with the communities we hold, uh, now, you know, virtually, of course, we're, we're holding virtual meetings in which we talk about, so most of them local and regional issues uh, and address and, and try to, uh, one, provide community members uh, the knowledge and the resources necessary for them to understand what is happening in their community, and then also provide a call to action, right? What is it that we need to do? Um, because it's not enough for us to understand the issues, but also we need to take action, right? And some of those times uh, that might mean calling our local elected officials, right? Calling agencies like actually AQMD and our and the, and the members at the AQMD board and making sure that we are engaging in those conversations. We believe that to be a critical component in bringing change. Um, and so for us, you know, it's, it's been anywhere from statewide bills to, you know, advocating on, on uh, BNSF rail yards to advocating for, uh, you know, even rent forgiveness, right? Most recently because of the coronavirus pandemic, our work has shifted to be uh, now very focused on the urgent, really life and death uh, issues that we are facing in the community. And as, as we all know, uh, that pandemic impacts environmental justice communities in a very disproportionate manner. And so uh, a lot of the times, you know, many, many times our organizations might not uh, take an, um, a holistic intersectional approach, but we do, right, in terms of both addressing uh, environmental justice and policies in conjunction with, you know, what folks are living, whether it's homelessness, whether it's, you know, immigration issues, right? And so those are all things that we uh, continue to advocate because those represent the communities that we serve. Next uh, slide. For our community organizing piece, right, it's the bread and butter we like to call the bread and butter of our organization. Uh, this is because without the community uh, really, uh, you know, being there at the forefront of any issue, really, uh, you know, we wouldn't have an organization, right? If we didn't have community members who were willing to put their story out there, how they have been impacted by environmental injustices, right? Whether it's through 
uh, you know, the increase of asthma rates, right? Cancer, all of those things are what makes uh, really our work and, and so critical, right? The fact that these are people's lives, you know, in the line and the fact that they're willing to come forward and share their personal story, which a lot of the times uh, can be very, very uh, daunting and, and a very, you know, uh, intimidating and scary process for them. Um, and so we, we do a lot of education with the community uh, and empowering them to also uh, feel comfortable in sharing their story because we truly believe that there's a strong, strong uh, power in, in narrative and, and in, in sharing our own personal stories, particularly as it relates um, to advocacy change and to whether it's policies or, or other changes in our community. Uh, a lot of our programs also um, have leadership development com um, opportunities, and some of these tap into even, uh, you know, life skills, right? We have done several of um, English classes, right, for community members in which they are able to, uh, you know, practice and learn some of the basics of English, and that way they feel more comfortable and empowered sometimes to be in settings that are predominantly English-led uh, in, in in that way. And uh, we also have a pretty strong youth engagement program in which we try to really engage high, you know, high school students, college students, and just youth in general, and have them start developing that interest um, to advocate for environmental justice and to be leaders um, in their communities. Next slide. One of the particular things I, I wanted to share is our COVID-19 relief fund uh, that recently, you know, will uh, actually, we started in, in April, a little bit after uh, the stay-at-home orders uh, were, were given and the pandemic started, you know, uh, really impacting the financial um, situations of households, right? We found that one of the best ways that we could directly provide a, um, a support to, to the families was through a relief fund. And so we started really, you know, uh, doing what we do best, which is, you know, organizing and talking to folks and uh, fundraising and asking for, for donations and grants. And through that, we've been able to have two operations. One is, um, well, now actually three, but the two that initially started is uh, care packages. So on a weekly basis, we deliver anywhere between 15 to 25 care packages with, uh, with organic fruits and vegetables and uh, also um, basic you know, household supplies like toilet paper, um, at some point, you know, toilet paper was was very very scarce, and uh, we were one of the you know only kind of like uh, we were trying to get toilet paper from all kinds of stores, and and trying to even you know a couple of toilet paper rolls could go a long way to families, um, and and also families that are um, you know were not able to uh, due to medical conditions you know expose themselves or go out and 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 do any grocery shopping, and so we have continued to do that since April. Uh, till now, we're, we're still continuing to do that. So actually, uh, today on, on Wednesdays, every Wednesdays, um, our volunteers and, and organizers put together the packages, have a list of folks um, that we refer. So I actually encourage if anybody out there um, has a family in, in areas where, where we are at, whether it's the city of Riverside, Harupa Valley, Myrna Valley, um, San Bernardino, Fontana, those areas um, that we serve, we are more than happy to provide, add them to the list and, and uh, deliver a care package. So at the end, my contact information is going to be there. Feel free to shoot me an email at any time and just say, hey, you know, there's a family that I know that's in need could, could benefit from a care package and we'll add them to the list and we'll be more than happy to provide those services. In addition to that, we established the Emergency Relief Fund, uh, which was financial um, uh, financial so, um uh, spot, or support to families, right? Um, it was it, through a whole application process. We had, uh, we have a committee who establishes who gets the funds, and you know, we have a that one was a pretty, uh, it's it's a pretty thought out operation. Um, not so, I guess, not so, um, you know, grassroots in, in the way that, uh, we, you know, we have to make sure that everyone who who, who is applying, you know. We would call them, make sure that their information is accurate, all of that, just because there is a financial component, right? Uh, and that we are reporting that on our end as well. And so um, we have, because we, you know, we're sort, it's been a couple of months, we did not think that we would be running this operation for, for this long. 
we have put a pause to that piece of our program uh, until we continue to uh, increase our, our funding. And then the other piece that recently happened out of necessity really was um, a uh, desk for distance learning drive that we've been doing. So we were able to partner with uh, our local uh, Harupa Valley Unified School District and um, we were able to fundraise some additional funds to provide desks for students uh, as they are learning, uh, you know, at, they're at home and doing distance learning. Uh, it actually started because we were cleaning the office and we had a couple of desks to donate and we got over 150 people contacting us and asking us for desk, and we only had about four or five. And so at that point, we, we realized the need is huge and it's there. And it was people contacting us on Facebook, calling our office, you know, texting us or saying, hey, I heard about this. And so then we just started gathering our, our resources and, and our, um, you know, partnerships. And we were able to give uh, both uh, backpacks with school supplies and um, also uh, the desks for for students and so that's still ongoing because uh, the desks have actually been short you know the store doesn't have a lot of desks you know the, of where we got them and so we're doing it in phases and so we hope this this past week we have, up to now we have given 70 desks and we have about uh, at least another 50 uh, to give out that you know we're waiting for them to arrive and next slide And uh, for our civic engagement, which is actually the work that I uh, directly lead and, and sort of oversee is uh, really around civic uh, education, voter outreach, and, and much more that we do, right? And this is both uh, during uh, election time, but also off during you know, non-election time, because there is always ways for us, uh, whether you are a registered voter or not, there's always so many ways for us to engage with our representatives, with the people that uh, represent us and also making sure that, you know, we understand uh, the nuts and bolts about voting, right? When are the deadlines? When, where do I drop off my ballot? And this year is going to be particularly uh, interesting and, and challenging and also many opportunities for, for learning because, there, you know, given the pandemic, there's going to be a shift in, you know, uh, voting drop off locations and times. And so, uh, we are really uh, excited in, in many ways to implement new strategies, whether it's through social media, through, uh, you know, you know, distance um, communication with people, just dropping off things at their home without talking to them, which I'm sure they will appreciate because, uh, you know, not many people like, you know, strangers knocking on their doors, right? Uh, and of course, calling and just letting people know, hey, the elections are coming up. Make sure you uh, are able to have all the information that you need uh, to cast your vote. And next slide. And um, actually that, that is um, all I have. And so my contact information is there, uh, my email, um, our website. I really want to encourage folks, right? If you ever even want to just brainstorm something or you have an idea, um, I love taking those opportunities to network with people and uplifting our work, you know, as, as a region and, and uh, even outside of this, of this, um, of the group, right? Just making sure that we we have a lot of learning uh, opportunities now in, in this uh, new era that we're living in. And a lot of these, I think are gonna be good for us to implement long-term, uh, especially when it comes to engaging community uh, virtually, right? Many community members wouldn't be able to make it to meetings because of childcare issues or transportation. And now, you know, they're able to join in from, from the computer. Uh, we've been, you know, uh, able to, teach a lot of the community members how to use Zoom, how to use all these uh, you know, tech tools to make sure that you know, they stay engaged and involved. Um, and so I'm happy to answer any questions as well if we have time and, um, and or you know, however we like to proceed. So thank you for, for this opportunity. Thank you. Excellent presentation, packed full of information. I'm jotting down ideas. Great work you guys are doing, Italia. Great work. You know, something, there is something to be, I, I try to see the glass half full instead of half empty. We have this pandemic. Yes, we do. But the way that we're rising to the occasion, stepping up to the plate, all those, you know, catchphrases, and the humaneness in us is coming out and we're helping people that need help. And I'm finding in, in the baskets and the, bo or the boxes that we're giving away, some of these people needed these boxes before the pandemic. 
you know, the pandemic is just now a reason for us to get to them, an avenue, a pathway for us to get to them. So let's just keep seeing this half full and, and continue the work that you're doing. Great job. Great job, CCAEJ. Great job. Uh, are there any questions for her? I don't see any, any comments or questions, none. Um, oh, there we go. I've got, uh, I, I see you, Valerie. I've got Todd Heibel's um, hand raised and then I'll come back to you, okay? All right, Todd. Hi, great. No, the, just a quick comment. Um, so, um, so it, it, um, <clears throat> great presentation. I, I completely agree with, uh, with Fabian. Um, and and um, on behalf of the uh, San Bernardino um, Valley College and District Sustainability Committees, we'll, we'll definitely reach out to you folks and invite you to some of our uh, meetings. So thank you. Good, good, good. Thank you. That's what it's about. Partnership and collaboration. Thank you, Todd. Good to see you. Uh, and we'll, we'll, before we do member updates, we'll go around and do introductions or as we do member updates so that the new members will get to know you all. Uh, Valerie, I, you're on. Um, uh, well, thank you, Thalia. I, I had um, a question about maybe workforce development. I know um, once I give my update, I'll speak a little bit about the um, program I work for, but we do have a job training in solar industry job component to our program. And I think that'd be, I don't know if um, CCA EJ works at all with, um, or does any sort of um, work in that sort of field of like trying to connect people with new sort of um, jobs or, or, or skills or anything like that. But I would love to maybe connect with that if um, that is something that you work on in general and in increasing environmental justice jobs. Yeah, thank you, Valerie and, and Todd. Um, I'd love to definitely connect and, and to kind of answer that. We do actually um, are definitely engaging, especially as it relates to a just transition framework, right, which some of you might be familiar with and, and really making sure that um, our communities have access to these jobs, right, and that are able to be uh, especially, especially in our region where we're finding that warehousing uh, jobs are, you know, the primary um, workforce that's, that's, you know, that our communities are in. Uh, we want to make sure that there's a vast opportunity of, of workforce development. Um, and we actually work pretty close with some of our, um, you know, uh, local and, and statewide um, partners uh, um, with both labor and other nonprofits in that um, mm -hmm. in those conversations. So I'd be more than happy to to make sure that you know we kind of partner up in that. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Great. great. Thank you. Oh, great. That's great news. Uh, any other questions or comments? Um, I just have a suggestion to tell you. Have you for desk? Have you guys thought about contacting some of the school districts for discarded desks and things like that that they're not utilizing? Yes, um, actually, for the desk, we did contact um, one of the school districts. Uh, we haven't contacted others, but we did contact one, which was Harupa Unified School District, and they were able to donate. I think it was a total of, I, if I'm not mistaken, fifty to eighty desks. Wow. Um, that they received actually from a university, from La Sierra University. Ah. And so it was sort of like a, a combination between La Sierra University, the district, and then us in terms of the uh, disbursement and contacting people that were, were in need. And then through um, the relationships that the district has, they were able to get the backpacks and school supplies through a grant that they have uh, with Kaiser. Mm -hmm. And so it was like a multi- uh, a multi-collaboration uh, to serve our community, and it came at the right, you know, at the right time, uh, in in the right um, framework. And so we were really appreciative of that. And I, I just want to echo, as as mentioned, um, it, we are finding out that, um, as you know, as you all are finding out as well, right? Some of these issues that the communities are facing, they've been facing long before, right? And the, the pandemic has just really uh, right. exacerbated all of these issues. And, and even when it comes to you know, mental health and all of these things that um, our families are facing and the communities are facing, uh, I think this is a time for us to start implementing really good 
support systems, support mechanisms and um, and resources, right, into these areas that have, that really are long overdue, right? Whether it's, um, you know, the, the schools obviously are a huge component, especially with us, because a lot of our parents, a lot of our community members are parents and have young ones, right? Um, when it comes to childcare, right? And all of these issues that sometimes we, um, you know, might not think about when, you know, we're, we're advocating for environmental justice issues, but for us, you know, they're intersectional. If we want someone to live, work, and play in a healthy environment, you know, they also need to have um, the resources and the support in place at their home, you know, in their job, in their, in their neighborhoods to, to be able to really um, have a safe space and, and, and strive and, um, yeah, strive in, in the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. I totally agree. Totally agree. Any other questions? And I'm going to, I'm going to not, I'm not going to use the word still. I'm going to lift your desk, by, your desk idea. Cause I think that's, I understand the importance of having the right work environment. And for some kids in the beginning of this teleworking, I was sitting on my bed and, and I took an old storeroom and converted it into an office. And I'm so much more productive sitting at a desk than I was sitting, you know, in my bed with my computer on my lap. So that's a great idea. I never even thought about that. That's a fabulous idea, in fact. So, uh, yeah, I'll be lifting that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you again for that, that great presentation. Uh, with no other questions or comments, thank you again. We'll go to Alicia Rodriguez, who is our EJ uh, lead. Uh, I think we were bumped either in this committee. No, we were bumped last time for this uh, presentation. So Alicia is going to give us an update on our EJCP efforts. Uh, and I forgot to tell you guys, these are all attachments in your agenda packet. Uh, and this is attachment number four and are the slides are available to you. So Alicia, Senior Public Information Specialist, you all know Alicia. Uh, you're on. <laughs> Thank you, Fabian. Good afternoon, all advisory council members. It's great to see familiar faces uh, and especially also seeing fresh new faces. So I'll do my best to also provide some background information on some of the programs. And also I'll request, you know, I'll post some questions to the advisory council to get some feedback and some suggestions. We have note takers on hand. so. We'll be taking down all of your comments and suggestions for the programs as I go by. Next slide. Next slide. So just a reminder for all of you sitting here as advisory council members, you are part of the Environmental Justice Community Partnership. So the programs that we work and that we plan are all under this umbrella that I'll refer to as EJCP. So the programs that I'll be highlighting today include the Advisory Council, which is the meeting that we're in today. We have an Environmental Justice Advisory Group, an Interagency Task Force. We have a Clean Air Program for elementary school students, CAPES. We have an annual conference, a virtual tour that we are planning and then continued engagement throughout all four counties. So I'll go over all of those programs. And also I request, you know, if you have any suggestions, ways in which to improve our outreach, ways to improve the program, we're always seeking um, to improve these. And then also that's what the advisory council is here for, to help us reach communities that need these programs. Next slide. So just some background information on the advisory council, which is the meeting that we're in today. This is this was established in 2015. And so really the members here serve to assist in the development, the implementation of ongoing programs, which I'll get into today. Next slide. So the other program that I really want to highlight, and I think it's really important, especially when you look at the history of the environmental justice movement. Uh, in 1990, the South Coast AQMD Governing Board established what's now the Environmental Justice Advisory Group. It was called something different in the past, but it served 
as a body to assist the governing board and staff on the impacts of air quality on the most disadvantaged communities within South Coast HMD. So it's important to also know I mean, this has been around for about three years and it's here today. So the next meeting is on Friday, October 3rd. And that body is composed of you know, union members, community stakeholders, academia, um, and we really try to capture as many different careers and sectors and community activists and stakeholders within our work region to receive feedback on environmental issues at South Coast Community. Next slide. The first program that I want to highlight is the Interagency Task Force. So early on in 2017 and 2018, there was the formation of, of summits that were put together to really strategize and also meet with other agencies and community members on how to best streamline the complaint processes. So out of these two summits, the point is that there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And so one of the things that was asked was the, to create an environmental justice interagency task force. I know it's a mouthful, but so the, the task force meets quarterly and works to really streamline communication among agencies and then also with the community and see where the gaps are. Next slide. So, one of the things I really want to is that we recently hosted the interagency task force training. And during the training, we actually had Lisa Hart, who is an advisory council member, present at the training. But we had about 80 participants from government to the community participate. And really learn how to improve service, improve communication with the community, work how to um, streamline those complaints, and also really importantly, really wish how to change the way they process complaints during COVID. So, you know, during that time, they saw a lot of um, calls, drop. So one of the things that they talked about were virtual inspections. And what I do also want to highlight on this is that we we had eight participants and we got about 50% surveys returned that indicated that the training was very well received, that it was what they expected to receive. And then some of the comments also highlighted the need for the creation of perhaps a training that's statewide, that really connects not just Los Angeles County, but other counties together and working to really share what works for different agencies. So that's something that we'll look into and that's something that we'll discuss at the next interagency task force meeting. But again, we have a series of goals that are always changing as time goes by. And so one of the other great things that has come out of the task force is a who to call guide. So this is a guide that was created by the task force that is available for the community to print and also digitally. And I think we're, we're gonna go to print in about two weeks or so on this. So we're really excited. We got final feedback at the training from an array of participants. So that was also really helpful. So that should be coming out soon. Next slide. So the Clean Air Program for Elementary School students is a program that's very exciting to a lot of our staff and also exciting for the community. So the Clean Air Program for Elementary School students, I think I presented this in the past as a Clean Air Ranger Education Program. It's the same program, we just renamed it. But really this is an elementary school education program targeted to all schools within our Fort County region. And really what the program does, it is that it informs and educates students 
on air quality, health effects, air pollution, and it encourages students to become clean air heroes. So really, we want to engage them and make them excited to learn about the, their environment, but also the air that they breathe. So one of the things that we also highlight and encourage is for them to download our South Coast AQMD app. We give them a brief tutorial on how to read the AQI so that they can implement this as part of their, their daily routine. Especially now, as Italia mentioned, a lot of the students are engaged in distance learning. So what this means is that they're not going to school and also, you know, sometimes the school leaves them inside if it's bad air quality day. Now really they're at home. And so having them be informed while they're at home is really important. We had to kind of pivot midway because the students went to distance learning. So early on, we were focused on assembly presentations and we had to kind of stop and, and think about having this go digital so or virtual. So we're in the process of creating a series of videos for the students and also in the process of working on an outreach plan for all four counties. And so what we really want to do with that is create a program that's accessible for all schools during distance learning and for them to implement at their own pace. Because one of the things that we know is is through a series of interviews with administrators and teachers is that they're really overwhelmed. This is a new process. So really giving them time to adjust and also creating very short condensed videos is something that may be effective for the students. So that's a program that we're working on. Some of the videos will include information on air quality, on what the air quality flags mean, what the colors mean, uh, what air pollution is, you know, what they can do as clean air or air quality heroes to help clean their environment and protect their environment. And then also how to download the South Coast AQMD app. So we're very excited about this. And I do wanna open it up to the advisory council members on any suggestions you might have for this updated version of the program now that we're going virtual. And I'm sorry if I had any audio problems. I was getting a series of messages that you probably couldn't hear me. So I do apologize for that. But if, do any of you have any feedback on this program? No feedback? Okay. Just know you can always contact me. But if you do think of anything, um, let me know. And then is there any other way that we can be reaching out to the students during distance learning or during COVID? So I'll pose those questions and I'll, I'll continue on with my presentation, but please know that you're always welcome to send me suggestions even, even afterwards. Another really exciting and upcoming event that I want to highlight is the sixth annual Environmental Justice Conference. So again, we've held this conference. This is the sixth annual conference. And this again is one of the programs that we had to rethink and completely, completely think about what issues are impacting environmental communities, environmental justice communities currently. So early on, we had an an in-person environmental justice conference planned. And we had to reshift our focus and think about how we could bring this program virtually to more people. So we did change the topics, we changed how we we're going to present this program. So early on, we were going to have this at in Riverside. So we were really looking forward to that. We had gotten feedback, I think from Todd various times and other folks on bringing this program to Riverside County and San Bernardino. So luckily this will be accessible to even more people if we have it virtual. So in some respects, it's, it's a really great thing that we're going virtual. But again, this year, the conference is called A New Era of Environmental Justice or Community Survival. It's on Wednesday, October 28th. I'll be sure to send out the link to register. Registration is open. So any way that this advisory council can really help 
spread the word, whether that's sharing that with your organization, sharing that with, you know, high school students, sharing that with college students, anyone that would be interesting, community members, um, whether they speak English or Spanish, we really encourage everyone to be engaged. There'll be something for everyone there. And so we will be using Zoom and Whova to host the conference. And some of the topics that we'll be discussing is, a, is an update on AB 617 and what that's looking like now in its second year of implementation. We'll be talking about youth united to change the world. Now more than ever, we see a lot of youth really leading the climate change movement and leading the environmental justice movement. So their voices are really important. And so that's another breakout session that we will be hosting in a Q&A type of format. We'll be hearing from health professionals on what is happening on the front lines and in the community. You know, how does this look like in an especially environmental justice communities? We'll be interviewing women in the environmental justice movement and talking about where we're headed and how women have been a, a great part of that movement now and you know from its inception to now and we'll also be taking a closer look at tribal nations on the front lines um, as we many of us are aware a lot of tribal nations have been most impacted by COVID-19 and our plenary, plenary session will be focused on race and environmental justice and just taking into account the climate in today's world and what that means for um, not just people of color, but the most vulnerable communities. So that's a brief overview of the environmental justice movement. Again, is there um, any way this advisory council can assist in outreach that maybe I missed or I, I didn't mention? Um, I have a question. Sorry, I don't know how to do the yeah. hand raising, but um, okay. with registration, that happens on many different platforms because I know we do our main outreach. If we don't have that people in um, our email list, then we do social media through like Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Are those, I know I've seen it on Facebook, but I guess I'm kind of a little unaware of the other ways you um, promote the event, but just wanted to make sure to get all those when promoting this. Absolutely. So right now we have our registration link through Whova, which is really great because you're able to see all of the attendees, you're able to get their bios, you're able to follow with the agenda. Um, I know they've improve their services as well. So now attendees will be able to view the conference through the website and also through the app. But another great thing is that we'll be streaming it live via webcast. So that's another great way for participants to view the conference without having to register if they feel uncomfortable registering. Um, so that's also open to the public. Um, again, we asked you to register if you want information on the speaker's bios or Maybe you want some contact information or you want to reach someone, then we, we would encourage you to register, but it's not mandatory for you to register. You'll be able to view it via a live webcast. And we have done that um, in previous years as well. Another thing that we're doing, I think this came up actually today, Valerie, was you know there may be some people that don't have access to a computer or um, don't know how to navigate registering. So we did want to make it as simple as possible. They could always call me or email me or view the link just live via YouTube uh, webcast. So we're trying added, to- Yeah, out of that discussion, I'm sorry, Alicia, out of that discussion that we just had today. So your question is so timely, Valerie. We will be exploring other areas, other platforms to make it easier for people to access if they actually wanna be attendees. So that, thank you for that, for, for giving us that opportunity to say that. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on outreach, on spreading the word, getting this out to the community, Lisa Hart? Oh, you're on mute. On mute.
You're on mute, Lisa. Yeah, I unmuted myself and then I got muted again. I know it's hard. I was, yes. Anyway, um, I thought Valerie's question was my question and maybe it wasn't, but I, um, I was also wondering if we can, if you tweet it and let us know you've tweeted it or can send us materials for, to tweet and post on Facebook and LinkedIn, I mean, uh, Instagram and all that stuff, then we can help, or I, I at least can help with outreach. If, um, Thank you for that. That's actually a wonderful idea. Um, I can send you all sample uh, blurbs that you can post on your social media account. We have yeah. some designated for Facebook and then some for Twitter with the character count. So we can definitely share that with the advisory council. That's a really right. great That would be great. Thank you. Oscar? Yeah, hi everyone. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to say that I think as a committee, we should all commit to inviting our communities. Um, uh, I, I just think that because we are part of this committee and we are like the driving forces that talks about environmental justice, that we should all commit um, to bringing people to, to join the conference, uh, especially since now it's more accessible. You know, we don't have to drive to um, where it was before L LA, East LA during the week or a weekend. So yeah, I, I definitely commit and um, I'll do my best to invite as many as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. That's really great. Paula? Yes, hi everyone. Uh, Paula here with PSRLA. So yes, I agree with Oscar and with Lisa, but I wanted to say that in addition to that, like how do we, as the Environmental Justice Advisory Committee, how do we bring, lift up the community stories, like what's actually happening on the ground um, and how that can reflect into the programs that are being carried by South Coast AQMD. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but what I'm trying to say is that how, how do we bring the narrative piece like the lived experiences combined with um, community data science that, that truly lifts up, lift, I, my English is terrible today, lifts up the, the challenges um, that are happening on the ground um, from, the, from the community's perspective. And I'm thinking specifically about the work that we're doing with our South Central Los Angeles PUSH project um, to understand pollution with our through our air quality academy and these folks are, are trained and ready to to share what they've collected the, the, the data that they've collected um, and it's about building a stronger bridge uh, a stronger connection between the agencies and um, the district and the communities to sort of understand better what they're doing and what they're how they're thinking about in terms of air quality policy. Um, so I don't know if that's this is a space that we can do that, but I just wanted to lift up what Oscar said. Yes, thank you for that, Paula. I I know just offhand, uh, we do our best to bring in not just members from environmental justice organizations that are really connected to the community that can speak to some of the issues that are happening in the communities, especially when we're looking at, you know, for example, our plenary session this year will be Black Lives Matters, race and environmental justice, what's happening on the front lines. So unfortunately, I can't release the names because they haven't, you know, um, said they're committed to the conference. So it's difficult because I can't really share the folks, but uh, that's something that we definitely are thinking about. And I really encourage everyone that if you think of someone that would be a really great addition to the conference, to send that name to Fabian or I or both of us. And, you know, we can take that into consideration. Nothing really is concrete right now. So this is a really great time for you to share, you know, whether it's a community member and we can, you know, do our best to find a place now or if not in the future for, for a conference. So that's a really good suggestion. Um, I know we didn't have a chance for me to present at the last meeting, but that was one of the things that I was going to ask of the committee was speakers and recommendations. So I think we can do a better job of, of asking that more ahead of time, but there's still time now to send in those recommendations. And then also in terms of the community science part, 
Last year, we did have a breakout session on community science and we had a panel discussion on that. So that's something that we, we have our eyes on, we're looking at, but I really hear what you're saying in terms of bringing the community voices and lifting their, their voices. So any recommendations, please let me know. I'd be happy to talk to you and collaborate. Absolutely. I was going to ask Paula, did you have any ideas or are we thinking of it? Because I like that. I like that a lot, what you just said. Uh, it only makes sense. And, and, and those stories are what really are impactful and people mm -hmm. listen to. They really mm -hmm. do. So let, let's talk farther on that and how we can bring that about, because I really do like that. Yeah. Yeah. And we're thinking about in terms of community, solutionary, envisioning, um, really rethinking, rethinking what um, air quality regulation looks like in the community and um, from both perspectives, the regulation and um, enforcement, but also pollution burden um, in terms of like, what, what are some rooted solutions that can drive clean production, um, economic justice, um, and those sorts of things to um, from the communities. Okay, all right. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll make sure to touch base with you um, after the meeting, Paula. Yeah, Anyone else? Great. Perfect, well, those were all excellent, excellent suggestions. We have a question uh, on phone caller, a phone caller. Oh. You have been raised on 990, I believe that's Harvey. Okay, can I take the public questions at the end of the presentation? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. So next slide. So the next project that we're looking at and that we've done every year is an environmental justice student bus tour. We've partnered with uh, different colleges I think last year we partnered with Cal State LA, San Bernardino Valley College in the past. And so one of the things that we're looking at with COVID-19 is how to re reshape this program to be able to still operate even now. How do we continue to engage students and how can we use this opportunity to really include more students in these student bus tours? So, Fabian had a really great idea um, that she heard about, which was using Google Earth to create a virtual tour. So that's something that we are currently looking into and something that we're exploring and are excited about. Uh, we're hoping to highlight San Bernardino County this year and hopefully work with Todd or some other stakeholders, maybe Italia and um, anyone else that's doing work out in San Bernardino, but we really want to grow this, this virtual tour, bring in you know, voices from the community, but also what's happening in the community. So it's something that we're looking into and seeing if other folks are doing virtual tours. I know there's different types of tours. There's like museum tours, there's, you know, They've done uh, open house tours and different types of tours, but this is more of an environmental justice bus tour. So that's something that we're looking into doing this year. We're currently working on that. We have a we have a tour in mind. We just need those partners. So if anyone has any suggestions for partnerships, please let me know. Next slide. So I just want to remind everyone that I did review a couple of programs that we're working on currently through the EJCP program, but that there are an array of programs at South Coast AQMD. And just to highlight some of those, I know Fabian and I are involved in a national environmental justice uh, roundtable led by Congressman Raul Grijalva. Um, and where we discuss environmental justice issues impacting the nation. So that's something that we try to keep up with. Uh, we have our AB 617 program, which we will do our best to highlight at the conference and see you know, what has worked and what maybe has not worked. So really just evaluate that. We also are proud to have the Young Leaders Advisory Council that I have heard tremendous things about. So I definitely want to tune into one of those meetings, but you know, we have the youth telling staff how 
we can improve our programs and what issues they're seeing in the community and things like that. And then also going in line with Italia, we also have a Why Healthy Air Matters program, which is focused on environmental justice communities and really engages and teaches students about air pollution at an age when they can really grasp all of that information. So that's another really exciting program that we have and that's maybe carried out to middle schools in the near future. So those are some examples of other programs currently at the district. You can always reach out to me to know more information about them. Next slide. I just wanna remind everyone something that came out of the task force training was that calls for complaints have really gone down during COVID, not too much, but it has calmed down somewhat. So I just wanna remind everyone that our call center is open. You're more than welcome to file a complaint and also to download our South Coast AQMD app. And especially right now during fire season, it's so important to have that app and check it every day and make sure that the air quality is good. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions. And I'm sorry, I do want to apologize. I was having microphone issues. So I wasn't sure if you all could hear me or not. Um, but if you have any questions, please let me know. Yes, yes, There we Ooh, go. Sorry, Alicia, one question. Did you mention the, the national EJ stakeholders uh, from Rep. Uh, Giralba? Yeah. OK, did you all already sign up for a round table? So we actually had a meeting with uh, Grijalva staffer regarding those roundtables that are going to from state to state. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Um, we have not signed up. Last time we talked to him was about maybe two or three weeks ago, I believe. And mm -hmm. he hadn't, he said he was in the process of speaking to different stakeholders, but hadn't finalized a date on one. And we did, mm -hmm. you know, let him know that we're supportive and, that you know, if we need to send out a newsletter blast or announce it here at the advisory council meeting, we would. But we haven't heard back. Is there anything you can share with us? No, it's, it's uh, I've I heard that they already had selected some groups or someone oh. in at, in LA to host this roundtable, but I don't know the group. <laughs> so I thought that it would it could have been South Coast. And I think it would be interesting to do something in collaboration with grass community organizations or environmental health groups um, to sort of bring traction to the work that y'all are doing and the work that the communities are doing. Um, but I also asked if there was funding for it, but it seems like there's not. Um, so yeah, I just I was just wondering if y'all were interested in a, in a collaboration for that. Certainly would be in, interested in a collaboration. We, we wanted to highlight our programs. We certainly wanted to do something on AB 617. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, something that has not been done across the nation. Mm -hmm. It's brand new. It's something that should be replicated. Um, so yes, we, we definitely are interested. Okay. Definitely. And then I'll do also reach out to Mr. Garza and ask him um, who he chose, who his partnerships are, and when it is, because we definitely want to be there. I know Fabian. Yeah, knows. same. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So I'll just leave it open for you to email me um, after the meeting and I'll connect with Paula, but Thank you all. Todd, I'll be reaching out to you soon as well. So <laughs> thank you. All right. So the next thing on the agenda is member updates. And uh, what I'd like for you to do instead of just going through the list and putting everybody on the spot, uh, if you have an update, raise your hand. Valerie, just speak up since you don't know how to raise your hand. I don't have a problem with that. But please identify yourself and uh, who you represent if, uh, if you have an update now. And if you guys don't raise your hand, I will call on you. <laughs> Oh, and I also wanted to, while you guys are thinking about it, I also wanted to uh, introduce and let you all know that our DEO of uh, LPAM, Derek Alatori, is joining us this afternoon too. So I see Lisa first. Lisa, do you have an update today? 
Uh, I realize it's more of a question. Uh, I'm with the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance and we're, we're working, one of our projects as I've mentioned before is we're working with DWP to um, help uh, let folks know about how they can get electric vehicles uh, to overcome barriers that folks have. So when Philip was talking about the clean vehicle rebate project funding, I don't know if he's still on the line, but I'm wondering, because one of the things we really, really want to promote <coughs> is, is your program, Replace Your Ride. Uh, I'm finding we've done a survey and are going to be doing a focus group tomorrow. And we're finding that a lot of people who are eligible, as I'm sure you know, a lot of people who are eligible for that project uh, don't know about it. Uh, so we really want to help get the word out and I'm realizing, um, I don't know, know exactly what the source of that funding is, if that's connected to the clean vehicle rebate project or not, but just wondering about thoughts regarding funding for that going forward. Clean vehicle, anyway, the state, state incentives and replace your ride or whatever else. Philip is still on the phone. Philip, you, uh, on the uh, meeting, you want to take that call? Sure. Question? Sure. Um, yeah. So basically, at least for the South Coast, the Replace Your Ride program is uh, mostly the EFMP funding, but CVRP, all that in the past, as far as I'm aware, has mostly come from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, kind of like the cap and trade funds. So that is uh, kind of put in jeopardy this year based on the fact that they didn't do an allocation of GGRF funding at this point. So um, we haven't really gotten indication that they're going to do a special session this year or a lame duck session in November, but because the August auction was much more successful, 474 million, then you go, okay, well, if the next two or something similar, there should be funding actually to allocate. It would be maybe less than they did last year, but there's still something that would help. So we're still definitely monitoring that closely and hoping that they will find a way to be able to allocate money and it would go to many of the programs, including EFMP, CVRP, and our AB 617 incentives, so. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Philip, thank you, Philip. Uh, Eddie, did you have a, a update today? Uh, no, ma'am, I do not. Thank you. It's been a great presentation or a series of presentations. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Um, what about Oscar? No, I'm okay. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, Rebecca is Rebecca. Yeah, Rebecca's here. Hi, Rebecca. Did you have an update today? Hi, yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca Saragosa with Leadership Council. I work in the Eastern Coachella Valley. Um, and I just wanted to mention some of the work that we've been doing for the past couple of months, um, particularly around the Salton Sea. Um, so us, Leadership Council, and some of our partner organizations have been hosting community meetings to update residents on what's happening with the Salton Sea. And so the state um, has a draft draft suppression action plan that includes different projects that they're planning. Would someone make their phone? I can hear some noise in the background and we can barely hear Rebecca. I'm sorry, Rebecca, for interrupting. But I need you all to mute your, mute your phones, please. Thanks. Thank you. And so we've been monitoring what the state has been doing in terms of their draft plans and new projects that they have for the Salton Sea. Um, what's coming up this month is that the state is going to start their NEPA process um, to get all of the permits they need to actually start construction of dust suppression and habitat projects at the sea. And so we've just been you know, following all of that work and updating community residents. And since the Salton Sea does have a lot to do with air quality and public health, we've also been trying to connect that effort or that work with the AB 617 um, efforts in the ECV. Um, we hope that, you know, our RCSC committee is still trying to move forward with the charter, um, but hoping that once we start talking about um, the draft air monitoring plan and emission reduction plan that a lot of those policies and programs 
can help address um, the air quality issues that are being um, exacerbated by the Salton Sea. So that's you know just a little bit about what we've been doing in terms of our air quality work in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, was there Valerie? Hello, everyone. Um, I am with, for those of you who don't know, I'm with the Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing Program, SOMA. And um, since we have, we reached our one year um, program uh, milestone, or I guess <laughs> launch date on July 1st. And um, we've definitely seen uh, just a lot of movement within, um, due to COVID within different parts of the program, um, particularly with uh, contractors and um, property owners um, not being as receptive at this moment, just with um, a fear of not wanting to join programs. So we had very successful first year and then COVID hit and now we're seeing um, lower applications. But uh, we, what we are seeing a huge intake or um, increase in it with what I mentioned to um, Ithania was that our job training component of our program, since we do require um, just a little bit on the program that uh, we have, uh, since the program is just like the name, putting solar, a rebate program from the CPUC to put solar on affordable housing, a component of the program does require job trainees to, um, from the communities to be involved. So they get trained, uh, free training from um, Rising Sun. And um, then we try to place people within uh, jobs, specifically SOMA jobs, as well as um, then have just uh, help with resume building. So there we've definitely seen a big increase, a lot of popularity of um, people looking for new skills and, um, so that's definitely been a big focus for our program right now. And um, as we've, we're tr to make the program also more um, accessible to maybe property owners who right now are fearing trying to make something a big, some uh, a big move towards solar on their pro um, on their properties. Then uh, we're looking at different forms of funding right now, or funding not forms of funding us, but forms um, of funding, because there's a rebate program, the funding or the rebate actually went to the applicant at the very end of the program. So we're trying to look at how to split that funding to um, increase uh, applications and, and yes. So that's Doma right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, let's see. Okay, there we go. Teresa, I see your hand up. Teresa Martinez. Hi, yes. Okay, so what I wanted to mention, I, well, recently I heard that there's a company that is working on the Exide facility out there and trying to do some more outreach with the community in the surrounding area. I really didn't know this was still going on, but they're having a, a hard time reaching community people to disinfect their lawn and their, their, their front lawn, their back backyard and so on and so forth. So I, I just wondered if, you know, we are actually looking <laughs> or, or monitoring what Excite is doing. That's a question that I have, but also, um, and I'm not sure if it's because of the fires, but the air quality seems to be, I mean, I live in Pasadena and it's always, when I look at the mountains, it just seems so smoggy in the mountain area. Was that due to the, due to the fires? Because I know a lot of people aren't using their cars at this time. I mean, now it's, you know, people are driving. I see the freeways are a little bit busier, but I, I didn't know if you could address that question as well. And then my final um, is just to give a shout out to a Latino veteran company that's here in Los Angeles that's offering COVID disinfection services. And it's a product that is, I mean, I'm just so excited about it because they're trying to educate people on their product. This is a new product that lasts for a year once you spray. 
and it continues to work with sunlight and with indoor lighting. And it is also gold green certified and not harmful to, to um, humans and so much more. So if anybody's interested in finding out more, please reach out to me. This is a, a way to get people back to work and to feel safe with the air quality where they are currently employed and restaurants as well. So, you know, we're getting a lot of traction for them and I'm just excited to share that with you. Great, thank you. So question number one, was that our, is, is AQMD, South Coast AQMD still monitoring as in monitoring, monitoring or just monitoring Exide activities? Was that the question? Yeah, just their activities. Uh, that I don't know. I'm, I'm probably certain that we are, but I don't know who. So that I'm certainly going to have to get back to you on that one. And then the air quality uh, is, yeah, certainly the fires have a lot to do with the air quality. I'll have an air quality specialist get back to you guys on that also. The, uh, you know, we, we tend to think that there's less cars on, on the street, and that's true. But I'm seeing five and six Amazon trucks on my street every day. So uh -huh. <laughs> that's true. You're right. So on, the, on the freeway, so that's more diesel fuel out there. So you know, some things have not changed. Uh, just different vehicles that are emitting the emissions. So um, I certainly will have someone know uh, get back to you guys on that, so that you'll know the full report on that one. Okay. Yeah, that's a good thing for us to know. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Todd, I see your hands up. Yes, hi, thank you so much. Um, this is Todd Heibel from San Bernardino Valley College. And then perhaps I can work with Lacey on this just to share some information. So our campus is, um, um, of course, it's going to be a virtual online uh, community meeting. <clears throat> and the date is Wednesday, the 23rd of September. So Wednesday, the 23rd of September from five to seven. And among the many topics that we will cover, um, we can certainly um, uh, include um, uh, environmental uh, justice in, in that community conversation. So, um, so Lisi, if that's okay with you, perhaps I could just forward that flyer um, to you. So thank you. Thank you, that'd be great. That would be great. You know, you'll find we've got six or seven departments at uh, South Coast AQMD. Environmental justice is entwined in, you know, all of them. It's in the fabric of every single department. So every single community, if, if somebody does, if it's not an environmental justice community, they've got a relative, they know of someone, or they're in denial about an environmental justice community. So it's still involved. So we appreciate that, that offer, and we'll get that information out to everyone. Thank you, thank you. Uh, was, did I miss anyone? I'm going down the participant list. If, if I did, um, our new members, if you wanted to come, Sienna, did I miss you? Did you have a update, Sienna? Hi, Damien. Um, no, no updates at this time. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, and then our uh, uh, two new members, if you wanted to speak up about the meeting, if not, no, no worries, we will uh, catch you next time. Um, I did not introduce myself for the new members. My name is Fabian Wesson. Uh, I manage the, for, for legis and I, I'm the Assistant De Deputy Executive Officer for Legislative Public Affairs and Media. For our department, which we shortened to LPAM, I manage the EJ teams, the AB 617 teams, and also YLAC, which is such a joy. I could talk about that forever, but I know we're over time. That's a group of individuals, 18 to 30, that are smart. Boy, I tell you, Dr. Heibel, you, <laughs> anyway, these kids got it on the ball, but um, uh, that's who I am. Uh, I've been with the district four years and love what I'm doing, love the people that I work with, love the communities that I work with. Um, and I think if we got everyone, we could go. Is there any other business? Seeing no hands. Okay. One uh, public comment. Phoebe. There's one public comment. Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, and that would be Harvey. Okay, Harvey. Harvey. We're ready for public comment. There's Anna. Uh, hello. Hi, Harvey. 
Hello, uh, my name's Harvey Eder. I'm with the Public Solar Power Coalition, and uh, I'm speaking for myself and the coalition. And we've been doing this stuff for many decades, going back to the 70s. And uh, some some folks I know, others I don't. There's a lot of new folks going around. I, I didn't even know there was a structure of four different entities with, within the district until today. Um, I didn't know there was an ongoing national group meeting, and I first heard about a, a meeting in D.C. about a year, year and a half ago, and we spent our grand, two grand, going to D.C. to go to this meeting, talk to staff, was told by uh, staff that this was a special meeting with JN on uh, what's co solar co-ops and whatnot, and uh, that you could not get into the meeting. It was full. And then I heard from Fabian after the meeting was over that who was there that uh, half of the room was empty. So um, not a happy camper with some of the new blood and what's in the process that's going down. And the history of, of, of what this is and where it comes from. And uh, got a certain perspective on that. I'd like to share it to some extent. Maybe you just got to write more. But uh, there's this thing of having to come in and talk at a half a minute, a minute of time in public comments with a, a, a perspective that you need to hear. It just depreciates it. It lessens it. And, and, and it cuts up public comment, the whole thing. We call in there. It says that you're in a listen mood only. You didn't have the code until I brought this up last week to get into the damn meetings with Zoom. Um, and Zoom's done, done some real racist things. And that their contracts going to be evaluated. And, and, and I talked with Fabian about creating new Zooms. And right now, there's a, there's $100 billion, uh, this, this, this PPP, and there's and maybe another 50. They won't say how much is left on, on the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the disaster relief money. And nobody's doing nothing about it. And the Democrats were coming into power, and there were 8 million jobs created under the Work Projects Administration uh, per year under, under, under oppression. And, uh, you know, we had CETA in the 70s. We started stuff and had, this, had the first solar job, local government. We tried to get 20 people to do solar. Greta saying, action, do it. We had to go to I talk to baby, and she said, well, she's a big fan of Greta. Well, Greta, you know, laid it down before Davos earlier this year. And they took that uh, to, to Congress the October 8th, uh, 18, saying that the, you know, the change is accelerating way beyond, and, and you all are doing nothing, and brought it straight to Congress rather than making any sessions. Has that been looked at at the district here in the state of California? I don't know. Um, let's ask Greta. What is, how does she, what, what should we be doing in action right here? Thank you, Harvey. We appreciate you. Uh, we have one more public comment, Anna Christensen. Hi, Anna. Anna, are you still there? Anna's a phone caller, Anna Christensen. Hmm, maybe we lost Anna. Anna, are you still there? I guess we lost Anna. Um, all right, well, our next meeting date is Wednesday. I cannot believe December the 3rd, December the 2nd, I'm sorry. Wednesday, December the 2nd. I cannot believe we're talking about December. Um, but if you have any other comments or suggestions, you know, you can always reach uh, myself or Alicia. Uh, until then, um, you all stay safe. I guess we'll miss the Thanksgiving holiday, however, whatever it will be for you. Hello. Uh, oh, there we go. Is that Thank Anna? You. Yes. Hi, Anna. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I couldn't figure out how to unmute. I really no appreciate problem. being able to speak today. No, um, you go right ahead. Do you want to finish or should I go no, right ahead? Go right ahead. You go okay. right ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm calling. I'm. Um, Anna Christensen, I, I represent a Sierra Club in the Long Beach area as both the conservation chair for our area group and as a member of the Los Cerritos Wetlands Task Force. Um, our task force is comprised of, of community members such as Captain Charles Moore, who is pretty famous for fighting plastic pollution, as well as longtime 
uh, tribal and environmental activist, Rebecca Robles Ahashiman. And today uh, we wanted uh, to uh, speak to the environmental justice community. I talked with Rebecca earlier in the day uh, from the perspective of, of a, a tribal perspective here in Long Beach on environmental justice. And um, we, uh, we are very concerned that California is becoming unlivable. Uh, we all are realizing that, but for tribal people, that, that has to do with natural spaces, which are often the last places where ceremony can take place, where ancestors continue to be left in the ground, and where their community villages, which once were, such as the Los Cerritos wetlands, which is part of the uh, tribal traditional cultural property and the sacred site of Favugna. I see my time is very limited. So what this group and, and as well as a community group, Citizens for Breathable Air, are requesting is a stationary air quality monitor in the wetlands. The Los Cerritos wetlands are as polluted according to the 2018 uh, map of, of community pollution as our port and on the west side. And this is coming from four different oil operations. One in particular, Synergy, has been reported to the AQMD. The AQMD has taken action, has cited them, but yet they continue to poison the air. We have residents form this group, uh, but the animals and the wildlife in the wetlands cannot speak. And that is why uh, our, our group, our task force, and, and Rebecca Robles are asking for the environmental justice community and, and your committee to consider uh, that environmental justice means protecting natural places. And they aren't necessarily where tribal people get to live anymore. It's, it's really great that one of your members is, is from a, 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 you know, the, a tribal uh, reservation, a place. But for the Hashman, there is no land, not one inch that they can call their own. So they, they continue to try to protect uh, their, their places and this community because this level of pollution should not be coming from a wildlife area. And we, we, we know the AQMD has so far not said that they can provide this, but we're encouraging the environmental justice community to please get a stationary air quality monitor in the wetlands and let's figure out how to stop uh, you know, uh, hurting this community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, for your uh, comments. Listen, can you make certain that you get in touch with either Alicia and I with your information so we can continue this conversation? Yes, and in fact, I'm so excited to learn. And again, you know, like you're saying, how do we get the word out uh, about this environmental justice uh, conference and, and the bus tour and all of it? You're doing a, a, a amazing work. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think that's the end of public comment. Uh, we announced the next meeting date is December the 2nd, um, 2020, last month of 2020. Unbelievable. Uh, until then, again, like I said, you know, you can contact Alicia and I, uh, or Julie, if you have any information or you need anything else. We will get back to you on those action items that, uh, uh, that have come up during this meeting. And uh, I think that's it. We could, uh, uh, may I have a motion for adjournment? I could second Oscar Rodriguez. Gotta have a first first. Oh. <laughs> My apologies, first. Okay, thank you. We need a little laughter in this world. <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> Thank you, Daya. All righty, it's been moved and seconded. I'm sure there's no discussion on ending this meeting, so we are adjourned. Thank you very much. All right. Great. Okay. Well, take care, all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Okay. That was that. That's kind of cool.